So in the previous section, um, we've shown this very interesting relationship between a kernel of two data points and the inner product of the feature vectors of those two data points. And those of you who have a bit of like experience with quantum computing see immediately now the bridge to quantum mechanics. In notation, it literally is just extending the comet to a line. Obviously, this needs to be filled with life. This is obviously just notation. So what this means is this thing here in quantum mechanics is the overlap of two quantum states. Those quantum states in quantum computing are always just prepared by a circuit. In quantum computing, we always think a quantum, quantum state is prepared by a state preparation routine. So let's call this SX. So what does that mean? If we have a quantum computer that can prepare a state, so implement a state preparation routine that somehow depends on an input x, it can prepare this quantum state. This quantum state we just learned can be interpreted as a feature vector. A feature vector actually inhibits space because quantum states live in a quantum Hilbert space. If we take measure overlaps or take in a project of two quantum states that were prepared in the same way but with a different dependency on an input, what we have is a kernel, and this is what we call a quantum kernel. This is quite interesting because that means that if I have a quantum computer that com compute overlaps and can prepare quantum states depending on data points, then we're in business. This quantum computer could, in principle, compute a quantum kernel. I want to give you an idea or an example of a quantum circuit that actually does what we said before. So if you look in the short and Richard Turner book in section 6.1.1, there is a very simple interference circuit that shows you how to compute overlaps of two quantum states. And we'll just go very quickly through like an example circuit like that. But there will be lots of different uh, ideas about this and actually if you have physical hardware there might be very different ways of how you can very effectively compute inner products of two quantum states and how you can encode data points into the quantum device. Okay, let's have a look. So we've got like two registers basically, the first one is just a single qubit that is an ancillary register and the other qubits are there to actually encode or represent the quantum feature vector that we have. At the beginning they're all in the round state and after the first Hadamard gate we have the first qubit in a uniform superposition. And now whatever our, um, our quantum circuit that actually embeds or encodes the input into a quantum state looks like, so we just call it here SX, um, we condition this routine on the ancilla being in state 1. So basically now our uh, quantum feature vector that encodes the input X is now entangled with the ancilla being in state 1. Next we do exactly the same thing, but now with input X dash or X prime, and conditioned on the ancilla being in state zero. So now we actually like have these two feature vectors um, in one big quantum superposition, but in the two different branches of the quantum superposition flagged by the state of the ancilla. And if we now apply a second Hadamard, uh, which get a, gets a bit more nasty, so I won't write it down, we can show that measuring the ancilla, we have a probability of measuring the ancilla in state zero, which is exactly one half plus one half times the real part of the overlap. So if the overlap you're looking for or the inner product of the kernel is actually a, a real value, you're already done. If uh, you actually have a complex kernel, you have to do a couple more things. But since in machine learning kernels are interpreted as similarity measures, it's, it's already a bit nicer to have real kernels in any case. So in that case, you're done here. So what does that mean um, if you have a quantum computer in this case or in this framework? that can implement a Hadamard transformation and then conditioned circuits that encode data points um, and can then uh, measure a single qubit, you can encode or, or you can implement a quantum kernel in your quantum device. And now, how does this actually look in the, in the bigger picture? The idea is now that you use the quantum device almost like an AI accelerator, like a little device that you have like next to your big like GPU cluster that probably like computes your machine learning uh, method. So you've got your system, which could be, for example, a support vector machine, and whenever the system or the machine learning algorithm needs a kernel, it queries the quantum device, and the quantum device answers with this kernel value. 
So this is really like a form where a very, very small portion of an algorithm is outsourced to a quantum computer. So it's a true hybrid quantum classical algorithm. What I want to do in the third section is talk a little bit about this SX quantum circuit that we saw and like never really explained or went into what that actually means. So the quantum circuit, the state preparation quantum circuit or data encoding quantum circuit has the role of encoding an input X into a quantum state. And this is not only interesting in the context of kernels, but it's actually like in itself a very interesting concept. So it could be understood as a quantum algorithm that does a feature embedding. So it takes an input and like computes a feature vector, so embeds the input somehow in a quantum state. And um, what I want to show you is that actually any procedure that encodes input into a quantum state, so any state preparations procedure that encodes data, is in fact a feature map or a quantum feature map. And as such, it gives rise to a kernel. So I will go through a couple of those examples and show you what kernel actually these different uh, information encoding procedures give rise to. So let me do the first example on the board. And what I want to show you is what kernel basis encoding gives rise to. Basis encoding, as defined in chapter 5 of um, the book on supervised learning with quantum computers, is basically the idea if you have a binary input. So for example, you've got a vector of two bits to associate it with a basis state, a computational basis state of a quantum computer. So basically we would encode the input vector 0, 1 into a state 0, 1. So this is probably the simplest you can get. And now also the state preparation routine that corresponds to this feature map. So you can see this is like kind of a feature map mapping a vector, an input vector to a quantum state. It's also not too, too difficult in this case because Sx on like a ground state of two qubits would basically just leave the first qubit intact but put an x gate to so flip the state of the second qubit. And what you get out of this is exactly the state that we're talking about. Now how does this give rise to the kernel? Basically, let's say we have another input, so we had here x, and let's say we now have also x dash, which is 0, 0, and we encode it into a quantum state 0, 0. The state preparation routine is there trivial because we don't have to actually do anything because the ground state is actually our quantum state represent, representing the input. Now what kernel do we get? The kernel is basically just the inner product of those two states. And the inner product of two computational basis states that are not the same is per definition zero. So what does this kernel actually do? It basically like checks if the two inputs are exactly the same or not. So it's a very harsh kernel, it's a very harsh similarity measure that's only one if the two are the same and zero else. You can interpret it in terms of a Dirac function, for example, or Dirac distribution. So we now like have a look at a couple of other kernels. Now getting to amplitude encoding. Amplitude encoding basically means that I encode a normalized vector into the amplitudes of a quantum state. And if we only have um, a two-dimensional vector that is normalized, so in this case x1 and x2, this vector is, is normalized, uh, so it has length 1, we basically just encode it into one qubit, and so that the amplitude of the zero state is x1 and the amplitude of the one state is x, x2. Um, in this case, state preparation is also not too complicated because we just need an Rx, so an x rotation, a rotation around the x-axis by a certain angle that turns the qubit so that it exactly like rotates it to the state that we saw up here. So, if um, we have more than one qubit, so for example, if we want to encode a four-dimensional vector, we need two qubits, then the state preparation routine can get quite difficult or a lot more difficult because um, we basically have to do arbitrary state preparation. We have to be able to encode any input into like any amplitudes. And the kernel this gives rise to is the linear kernel, obviously, because we now have basically um, our input vector x and x dash encoded in the amplitudes of a quantum state, and the overlap is just the inner product of those two vectors. Another nice trick is just to do the same thing, exactly the same thing, but now repeat the amplitude encoding scheme. So basically I encode x1, x2 in the first qubit, and I do exactly the same thing for the second qubit. 
So my stake preparation scheme on like both these like subsystems A and B is basically just do it once on zero and then uh, on A, system A, and then do it once on the qubit B. And what happens then we have got a quadratic kernel. And if we actually do this encoding not two times but D times, we get a kernel that is the inner product to the power D, which is basically a, a polynomial kernel, but without an offset. With a couple of tricks, you can also like put in an offset here. So basically, like basis encoding gives rise to like very sharp kernels, amplitude encoding gives rise to polynomial kernels. And now lastly, just to shock you a bit, um, we are only in this lecture talking about qubit systems, but you uh, may have learned that there are also continuous variable quantum systems. And for example, a continuous variable quantum system could be quantum optics. So in quantum optics, we've got um, quantum information saved in continuous variable, not only discrete variables like qubits. And um, in this paper by like myself and, and Nathan Killeran, um, we have the idea of like encoding um, or doing a kernel with a squeezing feature map. So let's look at the quantum circuit first. Now we don't have qubits here, but these are two Q modes. Think of it very vaguely as two laser beams, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and now my state preparation scheme is something we call squeezing. We squeeze the first mode and then we squeeze the second mode, which is an operation that in optics labs are like uh, getting better and better at the moment in the de de development of quantum optics. And now um, the squeezing operation has two parameters. It has basically like a squeezing amplitude and a squeezing phase. And we encode the data now in the squeezing phase. So you see already that now we're using uh, very specifically like um, the ideas of a very specific quantum device in this, term, uh, in this case quantum optics in order to encode data. So this is not just like a random quantum circuit, but this is now very device specific. And the feature map it gives rise to is absolutely horrible. I only wrote down, um, like I wrote it down for like only one input, not two inputs. So this is how it looks like. So this is actually an infinite dimensional superposition of quantum states. And the kernel gives rise to though is actually quite simple. So this is totally classically tractable. You can write this down and do computations. And now I showed you a couple of pictures of these kernels. And it turns out that this first parameter C, so in the first slot we don't encode any data, can serve a little bit as um, in the Gaussian uh, kernel the variance. So it can serve as a hyperparameter that it can tune in order to sharpen the kernel or like make it broader. So I can change my distribution 